In 1933, a Russian cargo ship was tasked with making a groundbreaking trip across northeast Russia through the Arctic Ocean in hopes of establishing a permanent trade route known as the Northeast Passage. Like so many ships before, it got stuck in the increasingly thick winter ice and was trapped for months at the mercy of the ocean currents below. Then, one day in February, there was a deep groaning from the ship's hull, and immediately, the captain yelled for everyone to abandon the ship and get onto the ice. This is the story of the maiden voyage of the SS Chelyuskin. Like the other countries that border the most northern reaches of the map, the Arctic holds deep significance for the Russian people. Their exploration of the era dates back to 1648 when a small group of Cossacks sailed up the Bering Strait and around northeastern Russia. This journey disproved the belief that Asia and North America were connected by land, but instead were separated by water. And although a route across northern Asia, known as the Northeast Passage, had been theorized for some time, this was more proof that a route by sea was potentially possible. Crucially, this meant that there was a potential route that was much more direct from Europe to the Pacific Ocean across the Arctic. For several centuries afterward, the northern shores of Russia were slowly exported, and several different countries undertook expeditions, but these were hindered by the long, harsh winters and frozen water. Ships would often get stuck in the ice and be forced to spend the winter until thawing out many months later. Several centuries later, after the Russian Revolution in 1917 and under the new leadership of the Soviets, Russia established a series of ambitious plans and goals nationwide. One of these goals was a focused expansion of what was named the Northern Sea Route. Siberia had since been realized to be extremely resource rich, and this route would help facilitate the transfer of people and goods across regions and eventually across the entire Russian nation from west to east. However, as with previous expeditions and exploration, this meant crossing the many icy seas on the northern shores. So to do this, they used the fairly recently invented icebreakers, which are ships made with reinforced hulls and in a shape that helps split the ice. In addition to these icebreakers, aircraft began to be used around this time, and planes would be stowed on deck and then hoisted onto makeshift runways cut into the ice. The planes would then fly ahead and scout the safest route for ships. By the end of the 1920s, both pilots and ships were becoming famous in Russia for this exploration, and the Soviet government was taking the northern routes more seriously. Then, in 1932, the Soviet leadership set up an Arctic commission to explore the region in as much detail as possible. The head of this commission was appointed Professor Otto Schmidt, who was a professor of mathematics at Moscow State University, a skilled geographer, and the director of the State Publishing House for Scientific Literature. He also happened to be a keen mountaineer and had led several expeditions to Franz Josef Land, which is an archipelago in the Arctic Ocean, to establish a scientific research station. During these expeditions, much like he had come to love mountaineering, Otto also grew to love the Arctic. Later that year, Otto was tasked with the first ever crossing of the Northern Sea Route in a single season. This plan called for him to take a ship from Murmansk on the northwestern shore all the way across Russia, then down through the Bering Strait to the shores north of Japan. For this trip, Otto used an icebreaker and was successful despite its propeller shaft breaking part of the way. Incredibly, using an improvised sail, the expedition successfully finished the final leg of the voyage. For the Soviet government, this was proof that the route was feasible. The problem that still remained, however, was that most icebreakers either weren't made for long distance travel or weren't big enough to carry much cargo. So even if a route was technically possible, it still might not accomplish the goal of establishing a proper trade route. So next, in 1933, Otto was tasked with repeating this journey, but this time with a brand new cargo vessel, the SS Chelyuskin. The Chelyuskin had just been built and was much stronger than most cargo vessels. Otto even called it a semi-icebreaker. The hull was specially designed and reinforced, it was twice as powerful as a standard cargo ship, and its cabins were built to withstand the cold in case it got stuck over winter. At the same time, it was still never intended to do something as challenging as a long Arctic trip. And despite how powerful it was, it didn't have the horsepower to break through thick ice like an actual icebreaker. Even still, it was the best option available at the time. For this second crossing, along with Otto, was the same captain as the year before. The ship then officially began its voyage on July 12, 1933 from what was then known as Leningrad, which today is modern-day St. Petersburg. They reached Copenhagen on the 16th and along the way calibrated the new ship's engines. After Copenhagen, the ship continued on to Murmansk for a last stop before making the crossing. Finally, they set off for Murmansk on August 10th to make a trip across the Arctic.
The route across northern Russia takes ships through a series of six different seas. The Barents Sea, which is first, was a smooth ice-free crossing. This is typically the least treacherous among them because it stays warmer due to the influence of the warm North Atlantic current. The Kara Sea, which is next, wasn't as forgiving. The first time the Chelyus can hit the ice, plates on the stern bent in, cracking part of the hull. This wasn't enough to end the voyage, but it wasn't encouraging either, considering the ice would only get worse. But this bad news was quickly followed by good news. Just before the ship reached an area known as Cape Chelyuskin, one of the four female crew members on board gave birth to a daughter. She was named Karina. About a month later in September, the Chelyuskin became one of 11 ships that passed the Cape just that year. In contrast, before 1933, only nine ships had ever gone that way, showing just how focused the Soviet leadership was on opening that route. In addition, all the other vessels that year had been icebreakers, so despite the damage in the Kara Sea, the Chelyuskin had already made an impressive journey. After passing the Cape, the ship entered the Laptev Sea and then the Eastern Siberian Sea, which were already 90 to 100% covered in ice. Thankfully, because it was still fall though, it was thin enough for the Chelyuskin to push through, and any of the damage was minor enough that it could be repaired. When they reached the Chukchi Sea though, which is the last stretch before entering the Bering Strait, things began to look much worse. This was where the ship on the previous expedition had broken its engine and the ice was even thicker this time around. The Chelyuskin continued to push through the ice for a time, but their speed got slower and slower. Frustratingly, at one point, they took an aircraft up and found open water just 16 miles away, but by then, it was too late. On September 21st, the Chelyuskin ground to a halt. The ship was officially trapped in the ice and its rudder was bent by 20 degrees. All the boat could do was drift east with the ice toward a bay northeast of the Bering Strait. That particular bay runs deep into the mainland, and sea currents push ice floes into it, smashing them together and compacting the ice. It's also an area that's prone to whiteouts, so using their plane or getting to them by plane was next to impossible. So, with no other options, the crew resigned themselves to having to wait until the weather improved and focused on other work. A little over a week later, on October 1st, Otto heard a sound in the distance. Through the whiteout, he could hear dogs in the distance barking and howling. At first, this was faint, but the noise kept getting louder and louder until dog sleds appeared out of the mist. It was a party of Chukchis, who are natives from that area. Apparently, after one of them had spotted the stranded ship, they launched a rescue party and made a journey of 25 kilometers by dog sled to get out to them. Otto then asked a crew member who spoke their language to go to shore with him. The Chukchis offered to take as many people as they could down the Bering Strait, where they knew an icebreaker known as the Lit Key was moored. Unfortunately, with only a few dog sleds, they would only be able to take a few of the over 100 crew. It was also a journey of more than 330 kilometers through frozen Siberia as winter was fast approaching. Because of this, Otto chose to send one man who was close to passing away unless he saw a doctor right away, and six other men he promised to send back to their day jobs if the ship got stuck. After the natives left, and in order to make it through the long winter, Otto began preparations to build a base nearby on the ice. But then, on October 5th, the wind changed direction and split the ice where they were setting up. The men who were outside working only just managed to scramble on board with their tools before the water surrounded the ship once again. Incredibly, the Chelyuskin was moving in, and even better, while it had been stuck in the days before, they'd managed to repair the rudder as well. Instantly, the crew's morale lifted, and an air of relief spread throughout the boat, only to be crushed again a few hours later when the ice retook its hold. From this point onward, they would be at the mercy of the ice and the water currents below it. For more than a month, the Chelyuskin drifted in circles with ice at the mouth of the Bering Strait, and no one on board had any idea if or where they might get free. On November 3rd, the ice they were trapped in actually floated into the strait, but they were still stuck. Several times, they even floated south past the St. Diomede Islands at the midpoint between Alaska and Russia before being dragged back up north by the powerful Pacific Current. On one of these cycles, this movement north was so rapid that Otto was worried that there was a good chance they were being dragged to the interior of the Arctic Circle. That meant they wouldn't get free within the year, and the ship itself was at risk from the weight of the ice. Now, Otto had previously contacted the Lit Key to ask for help, but when he had, they explained to him they had their own problems. Their engines weren't running at full power, so ice breaking was difficult, if not impossible. On November 10th, though, with the situation getting much more dangerous, Otto sent a message begging the Lit Key for help. He knew it was risky for them, but he felt he had no choice. However, despite the condition of the ship, the captain of the Lit Key agreed to do whatever he could. At first, he tried to go in directly, breaking the ice, but that was too much for the half-powered ship. They then tried going around one side of the ice sheet where the edge was close to the Chelyuskin, but that also didn't work. Quickly, conditions worsened and the ice got thicker and wider. The captain of the Litki then suggested they moor at the edge of the ice and the crew of the Chelyuskin walk over, but by then, there was 50 kilometers between them. Otto just couldn't risk that. 
Another option was to fly people over, but when the plane tried to take off, it skidded on the ice and was damaged beyond repair. This was unfortunately their last resort, so with a heavy heart, Otto then told the Lickie to stop trying to reach them. While all this was happening, the ice floe they were trapped on had been traveling in all directions, sometimes west, sometimes east. For a while, it even seemed to stop near the coast of the Chukchi Sea. Then, in December, the ice even melted enough for them to get underway, but just like before, it wasn't long before they got stuck again. By then, the sun had set for the last time, and they would have to endure months of darkness in the long polar nights. Incredibly, this was also the least of their problems. When the route was planned, Otto and the team never anticipated spending the entire winter on the boat. This meant they had to keep the ship warm for longer than expected, which also meant that the amount of cold they had wasn't sufficient for the entire duration, and if they weren't careful, they'd run out entirely. So next, it was the job of the first-class mechanic on board to bring consumption down. First, he gave bonuses to the engine stokers who used the least coal. Then he tried cutting off the heating for 8 hours daily, but this caused dampness to form in the walls of the living quarters, so he tried switching the heating off for 2 hours at a time instead. Then he came up with the idea to develop a new fuel using a mix of paraffin, crude oil, waste oil, animal fats, and anything else they had available. This proved to be enough to warm the essential areas and reduce the coal they were using, but either way, their coal consumption would continue to be a problem. The other problem they had that winter was water. They'd run out of water in late November, and by the end of December, they had to melt ice for drinking water. Afterward, quite a few crew members were tasked with gathering ice to bring back to be melted in a boiler. But as time went on and the crew solved some of their more pressing issues, they began to settle into their new life and even enjoyed some aspects of it, as weird as that might sound. They used the skis they had on board to scout for suitable spots for planes to land, and in their downtime, they'd even use them to ski for leisure and found rocky outcroppings to ski and jump off of. Several crew members even marked out a course around the ship using flags for racing. They also engaged in hunting competitions, and in the evenings, Otto would lecture on the latest scientific theories, followed by singing and music from anyone who brought an instrument. By February of 1934, they drifted right into the middle of the Chukchi Sea, and over winter, the ice continued to become thicker and heavier by the day, and Otto knew it was only a matter of time before the ship itself would be in serious trouble. Then on February 12th, the ship's engineer took his team to inspect the hull because the ice had been jolting the vessel more than usual. Now, even though there are 24 hours of night in the polar winters, there's still an hour or so of dark twilight where it's not pitch black outside. During this hour, the men descended from the ship in a negative 40 degree blizzard and walked the length looking for any damage. Luckily, they didn't find any, but they did find that a crack had formed in the ice on the front right hand side of the ship. This might seem like good news, but the engineer knew it meant the colossal ice sheets were shifting and would soon put even more pressure on the Chelyuskin's hull. The following day at 1pm, shocks began to shake the ship. Then 20 minutes later, the crack in the ice widened and ice began to press into the vessel. At first, it pushed the Chelyuskin back any distance it could go, but then, when there was no more space, it was pinned even tighter than the ice. After that, the ice began to crush the ship, squashing the engine room and some of the bunkers on the vessel's right side. The plates on the upper deck began to bulge and then burst while the crew was thrown around by one violent jerk after another. This was followed by the Chelyus concern to tip over to the left. Then, for a moment, everything seemed to calm down. Otto had already organized emergency storage to be put on deck in case something like this happened, so he ordered everyone to help move the supplies onto land. They used this leftward lean to lay planks over the side so they could slide supplies down before dragging them to a tent that had been put up days earlier. Once that was done, everyone had just five minutes to get their personal belongings. An hour and a half after the first crush, a violent shudder hit the vessel. Another part of the ship caved in, then a series of small jerks, one after the other, rocked the boat as water burst from one part of the ship to the next. This extra weight then pulled the ship's bow under the sea and water began to rush over the front of the bow. In the chaos, they sent one last radio message before dismantling the radio equipment and sending it off the ship. Then Otto and the captain ordered all but essential personnel onto the ice. At the same time, he and the captain and a dozen other crew members began throwing anything of use from the deck. They tried to round up the animals they'd taken on board, but in the chaos, the animals ran wildly. The only choice they had was to slaughter them and throw their carcasses overboard to be eaten later. Water then began to cover the passenger deck and then the ship tilted forward. The captain then shouted for everyone to get onto the ice and then everyone made a run for it. Otto and the captain then made it to the gangway, but only just, and as they ran along the passenger deck, the upper deck even broke above them. A plank broke from the gangway stairs and knocked the captain off the ship and onto the ice. Meanwhile, anyone left on board at this point poured out and jumped from wherever they could, disregarding the height of the fall to the ice below. Finally, the only man left on board was the quartermaster. 
He ran over, making it to the side of the ship, but then just as he began stepping over, the vessel flipped with such force that the engine and rudder were pushed out of the water and into the air. Any remaining store barrels and what was left in the upper deck then fell onto him, knocking him out. A few seconds later, the Chalyuskin disappeared under the water, and the crew could only watch as it dragged their quartermaster down with it. After watching the horrific scene unfold, the crew were tired, shocked, and scared. Otto decided the best thing to do would be to set up the radio tent, then their living tents, then have something to eat, and then get some sleep for the night. After doing exactly that, they woke up in the morning of February 14th and assessed their situation. The good news was that quite a few extra supplies, like fuel barrels and building materials, had floated up from the ship's wreck. For the first few days, Otto put the crew to work, fishing out whatever they could, and they also got the radios working, and when they radioed home, a plan was made to mount a rescue. A government commission decided that the best plan was to get as many of them as possible by air while providing dogs, sleds, and air support for the rest. At this point, the crew was stranded 80 miles or 130 kilometers from the coast. The nearest town was Cape Van Karam, so the crew would be taken there and then to Alaska before traveling back to Russia via London and Berlin. At least, that was the plan. In order to make this rescue possible, their first task would be to build an airstrip in the ice for planes to land on. This became the main focus of work in the camp, as they used whatever resources they had to make the landing as safe as possible. They also knew it would be some months before being rescued, so they had to keep the airstrip in good condition. In fact, this was exceptionally challenging due to the shifting ice. Thirteen times the ice under the runway broke, and each time the whole operation base had to be either patched up or moved entirely. While this was happening, Otto was coordinating the rescue and was busy figuring out who would fly out and who would be traveling by dog sled. Some of the women on the trip were annoyed to find out that he'd given them seats on planes, along with the four children and those who showed signs of illness. The reason they were annoyed was that they'd been working just as hard as the men and thought other, weaker members should take their place, but Otto was adamant. The planes were to take the women, children, and the sick. Until then, all they had to do was focus on keeping the airfield in one piece and wait. They came to call this temporary home Camp Schmidt. Unfortunately, flying to Camp Schmidt proved to be almost as dangerous as sailing through the Northern Passage. On February 14th, so the day after the Chalyuskin sank, a pilot named Sigismund Levanevsky was listening to his radio when he heard what had happened. He was a well-known and well-respected pilot, and he suspected they would be using aircraft to get the stranded crew. He then telegraphed Moscow, offering his services, and the following morning he was contacted and told he would be part of a special mission. He was then filled in on the details of the rescue operation and their takeoff point in Alaska. Thankfully, this was still pre-Cold War, and the Americans were happy to lend the Russians a couple of planes to help save their men. Afterward, a coordinated effort was undertaken for a precise rescue. This meant getting everything in place as quickly as possible so that by the time they were ready to launch, it wasn't too late in the spring when the ice would begin to break up and the planes could no longer land. Sigi was then sent to Fairbanks, Alaska with a man named Georgi Ushakov, who was an experienced Arctic explorer who was going to coordinate the rescue. Then, on March 26, everything was set and Sigi took his plane to the skies for the first time. The plan was to cover 500 miles and reach the town of Nome on the Alaskan side of the Bering Strait. As they made their way through, suddenly their speed began to drop as if the wind was slowing them down. Sigi then radioed back and asked what the weather was like ahead, and in response, he was told there was a blizzard starting ahead, forcing them to turn around and wait for better weather. Two days later, the plane took off once again, but this time they didn't even know what the weather was because the weather station wasn't functioning properly. But it was now or never because the ice was weakening day by day. So they continued on, and the conditions were okay at first, but eventually, the snow got worse, and the clouds got so thick that Sigi had to fly low enough to use telegraph poles to guide him into the landing strip in Nome. By some miracle, he managed to bring the plane down, and after landing in Nome, the next step was to fly over the Bering Strait to Cape Van Karam, which is on the far eastern tip of Russia. The plane set off once again the next day, and because the weather stations were working again, it sounded like it would be an easy flight. They flew over the strait and then along the Russian coastline, and everything was fine until they got to the Chukchi Peninsula. At that point, visibility was reduced to almost zero, and Siggy dropped low to see if he could find somewhere to land. After finding nothing, he took the plane back up to 5,000 feet and carried on flying with only his eyesight and his compass to guide him. Then, the clouds became a snowstorm, causing the plane to shake violently. Then, as they continued, Siggy noticed a film of ice had formed around the windows. Almost simultaneously, Georgie passed him a note saying the whole plane was covered in ice. Sigi then tried to climb over the storm, but as they ascended, the air was colder still, and the plane got heavier and harder to steer. Soon enough, the engines began to backfire, and before long, all the instruments froze. This meant he had no idea how fast he was going or what altitude he was at, but carefully, he altered the plane's course to take them away from a hilly area. It was only a matter of time before they went down, and he could tell they were dropping in altitude. All he could do was find as level ground as possible to land the plane. 
Finally, they reached the coast and he could make out the ice floes down below them. He then turned back toward the mainland as best he could, and as they approached what he thought must have been ground, Sigi pulled back on the controls as hard as possible to avoid smashing nose first into the ground. Sigi was then overwhelmed by the sound of metal scraping the ice, and then everything went dark. When Sigi finally came to, Georgie was shaking him desperately and asking him if he was still alive. Georgie then managed to pull Sigi from the cabin and bind the deep gash he'd gotten on his head. After the crash, Georgie's knowledge of the Arctic saved their lives along with the lucky location of their crash. They had landed in the same bay that the Chalyuskin had gotten stuck in several months earlier. The two men were then able to stay with some of the locals and even arranged to be taken to Cape Van Karam by dog sled the next day. And thankfully, the subsequent flights by other pilots had more luck. As the two men traveled by sled, another pilot flew overhead in a plane that the Americans had lent him. The weather had cleared by then and he made it to the landing site in a nearby town without incident. This clear window didn't last long and the weather stayed bad until April 7th, but when the snowstorms ended, he and the other pilots flew out to meet Georgie at Cape Van Karam. As soon as he landed, Georgie had him unload his cargo and take eight dogs and a dog sled on board for the crew who wouldn't be airlifted. Before the weather could turn again, they took off toward Camp Schmidt and landed at the icy airstrip a few hours later. After offloading the dogs and sled and patching up the aircraft, he took off with a group of passengers back to Cape Van Karam. After this first successful landing, he was one of seven pilots, including Siggy, who flew back and forth between Van Karam and the makeshift airstrip, getting 55 people to safety that April by plane. Everyone else was then successfully transported by dog sled, and despite being trapped in the ice for eight long months, just one person died in the expedition. That was the quartermaster who had gone down with the ship. After the rescue, the pilots involved were given the title Hero of the Soviet Union. Soviet leadership also considered the trip successful as they'd reached the Bering Straits and they went on to develop stronger cargo ships and started shipping on that route in 1935. However, even today with modern ships and ice breaking and even the changing climate, the Northern Sea Route isn't nearly as consistent as other routes due to ice, extreme weather and a lack of infrastructure through the Arctic. In 2006, fragments of a ship found 50 meters under the Chukchi Sea were confirmed to be that of the Chelyuskin. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to submit it to the form found in the description, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.